evening, everybody. Good evening, welcome. Today we celebrate Good Friday, and it's the day that we remember Christ's crucifixion for us. And it's the day that we, rem we remember the suffering that he went through on our behalf. So sometimes we don't like to sit in negative emotion, you know? We, we wanna get to the happy, fun part of the story, but it's good sometimes to remember um, and reflect on the weight and the magnitude of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so we're gonna do that together today as a family. We're gonna together remember what he did, knowing that Sunday's coming, right? We get to rejoice and celebrate on Sunday, and we can rejoice and celebrate today. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we can't. But I'm saying today is a day where we, re where we really remember the magnitude of what Christ did. So I wanted to read Isaiah 53, um, starting in verse three. He was despised and rejected by mankind. This is talking about Jesus. A man of sorrows and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took upon our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. So it's not just remembering the magnitude and kind of remembering the sadness for the sake of remembering sadness. It's remembering the, the sadness that he went through because of his great love for us. And we know that because of his sacrifice, we've been healed. So as we sing, I just wanted to put us all kind of on the same page. <clears throat> and uh, we just ask now, Holy Spirit, that you would um, remind us of your great love as we sing about the crucifixion of Jesus. We pray that you would speak to our hearts and that it would be something that just helps us understand, maybe in a way we haven't understood yet, how much you truly, truly, truly love us, that you gave your life up for us. So we worship you in this time, Jesus, as you're worthy of all our praise. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by
separated, the bridge was far too high. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind.
amen, amen, amen. When I think about Good Friday, what makes it so good? It's that a Savior was willing to come down from glory to redeem mankind, and that's you and I. And so what happened 2,000 years ago flows out to us. And can I just say, that should never get old. The fact that Jesus Christ poured out himself. And so sinners like you and I who were separated from God, who were missing it with God, I can't tell you, every time that I get to come on this stage, I know who I was before Jesus. And I thank God that he chased me down, even when I wasn't looking in his direction. Who's thankful that God? You finally got tired of running from God. And he pulled you out of that muck and that mire. And he put a song in your heart. So I don't care what, what the world offers. They used to say in the church, nobody could do me like Jesus. <laughs> and so I don't know where you are today, but Jesus is, is Lord. He is still good. And today we, we remember what he did for us. And so as you hear in the scriptures, this word, to tell us die, it is finished. He's not just finished with your past. He took care of that. The stuff that you do today, because you know you're not perfect. How many know they're not perfect today, right? Some of y'all were messed up walking into church this morning. It was like, but you made it, right? Praise God. So he covered all your mess up this morning before you even got to church. And then he covers all your future. And so there was a blank check on that cross that said, paid paid in full. There's a blank check. And so, you know, in Boynton, we cannot end when the worship set is over. We have to, we got to go one more time to make sure God hears us. And so Matt and the team, if you could just pick a, pick a, a verse from Jesus paid it all, let's celebrate that because he did pay it all for us. So let's worship one more time and then we'll, we'll close it out. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still redeem. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus paid. And we praise God right there. He's worthy of our praise. So why don't we just take a moment with Jesus right now? Maybe it's just a moment you want to thank him for the blood that washes you. Maybe you just want to thank him because you got up this morning and there's You're sleeping under a roof today. You open your refrigerator and there was food. It wasn't anything special, but God provided for you today. Maybe today you are weighed heavy on the mind and you just say, God, thank you that you give me peace that surpasses all understanding. 
And I see some of you with your families. And just, just a thought, maybe you, as you bow your heads with me and thank God, maybe you hold on to your children right now and you thank God for the family that you have. Because his blood covers everyone. Even the little ones that are learning how to say the word Jesus, learning how to pray, learning how to trust their Savior, who God has birthed with purpose. And so whatever moment you need to take and thank God for today, let's just do that together. You go in your own personal moment. Maybe as a family, you go together and you just say, Lord, thank you. So just take a few moments, lean into Jesus, and after some time, I'll pray us out. And so, Heavenly Father, we are reminded that Good Friday is only good because of what you did for us. It reminds us that you are a good, good Father. That is who you are, willing to die a death that we deserved, willing to take the punishment that was meant for us. But it's by your great love that you came down. So, God, we thank you for our families. We thank you for your redemption. We thank you that even today you are still speaking and moving by your spirit. And so, God, for today as we commemorate what you did, God, give us fresh eyes to see you in new ways. Let not Good Friday be business as usual but allow it to take us back to that moment where you saw each one of our lives, where you saw us becoming your sons and daughters. And so, God, we just say thank you for paying it all for us. We trust you. We ask you to fill us with your spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen, amen. amen. Yeah, we can thank God there for his blood. Why don't you greet the neighbor next to you and tell them hello, that you thank God for them. Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing today? I had trouble. I had trouble with the evening service. I was saying good morning to everybody. I'm thinking about <laughs> Sunday morning already. For those of you that are new, my name is Dwayne. I have the honor and privilege of serving uh, as our campus pastor. And I was thinking this is like my 10th or 11th Good Friday and Easter <laughs> service where I get to lead. And I am humbled every single time 
Because if you don't know, if you don't know me, uh, the, one thing that I, the one thing that I'm deathly afraid of, and still today I get so many nerves, is speaking in public. So God has a sense of humor. I was like, like God, I would rather be a doorkeeper in your house than necessarily on the stage, but I welcome you in the name of Jesus. Uh, we're going to be in two places as we go through the story of Good Friday and what this day all means to us. I pray, I pray you see it with fresh eyes because that's the way God has been speaking to me. I only have one quick, quick announcement. I want to tell you that Sunday is coming, y'all. Anybody excited? I know. <clears throat> we can't get to Sunday without going through Friday. But Sunday is coming, and so we have three services on Sunday, 7.30. Uh, they won't be childcare that time because we're, that's sort of like our sunrise service. Um, then we have 9.30 and 11.30, but don't all come to the 9.30 because that's where we'll have parking issues and we'll have to have chairs outside, which is a good problem to have. But, but we also want to make room for those people that only come once a year because the heart is that we don't want them just to come on Sunday. We want to come back the Sunday after that. Can I get an amen, somebody? So anyway, be praying as God adds uh, souls to his kingdom. Um, I pray also that you also receive it in a fresh way. So that's it in the way of announcements. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 26. If you can stand for the reading of God's word... We're going to read from Matthew 26. If anyone needs a Bible, yes, you can raise your hand so we'll get a Bible to you. We're going to be Matthew chapter 26. We're going to read verses 26 to 30. Then we're going to pray. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom." When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's pray and bow our heads. God, thank you so much for your word. It's alive and living. And in 2024, as we look back on Good Friday, we once again say, God, you are good. Let your word minister and speak. Let it transform. Lord, open our minds to receive our ears, to hear our hearts, to treasure the Word of God. God, and like we always pray, may we decrease and you increase. And Lord, for my notes, I submit them completely to you. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O oh Lord, our Redeemer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. So as I was thinking about this message, I thought about the Academy Awards. Anybody watch the Oscars? I know you were in church. You were just like, I don't watch that stuff. It's Hello? Hello? <laughs> I'm afraid to move now. <laughs> All right. All right. The Academy Awards. Let's try this. And in the Academy Awards, what, what do they do? They, they celebrate the, the best actor or actress or the supporting cast, best movie for for a lot of times, it's, it's not always true. Sometimes it is true, and I was thinking about the best actor, and I can't remember the guy's name who acted in Oppenheimer, and he celebrated at the end of the night. But I think about Good Friday being like a movie. 
But it's not just anyone who's acting. The best actor who's, who's acting, who's the star of the show, is Jesus. And Good Friday is good because of Jesus. Jesus and him alone, God in human flesh, come down from glory to redeem mankind. And so I want to take you through a few scenes as if we're in a movie. And we're going to start chronologically because if you were the disciples in that day and Jesus is predicting his death, as much as the disciples have been walking with him for three years, they don't understand the fact that he's going to be handed over, arrested. So to them, communion is just a meal. It's the Last Supper. They're celebrating the fact that the Passover lamb came, but Jesus himself is the one that's going to be offered as the Passover lamb. So the very one they're eating with is the Passover himself. And so as we look at the communion table, who are we in this scene? This scene one is communion. We are the ones invited to the table. <laughs> now, the table is exclusive and inclusive. The table that represents communion, that represents us celebrating the fact that Jesus died, the wafer that you have in your hand and the wine you're going to drink represents his body and his blood. But it's exclusive because... The sacrifice doesn't mean anything to you unless you are a believer in Jesus Christ. And so Paul says you don't just take it as if you don't have a relationship with God. If you have a relationship with God, raise your hand right now, right? So, so when, you, when you eat this wafer and, and you drink this cup, it represents something to you and I. It's not just any old wafer. I know we have them nice and pre-packaged and everything else, but when we take this wafer, it represents so much more. So when we read this, Jesus invites the disciples to the table. So imagine 12 at the table, but imagine Jesus is looking beyond saying that in 2024, on March 29th, there's going to be a bunch of people taking communion, remembering this very sacrifice. It's us with this communion. And so he says in Matthew 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. I want you to take out the wafer that you have. If anybody needs communion, the interesting thing to me in this text is that if you read just a few verses ahead, Jesus calls out his betrayer, and he still invites him to eat at the table. The disciples are saying, surely, Lord, it is not me. So, so what does that tell you? Jesus doesn't call perfect people to the table. He calls imperfect people like us to take communion with him. And this body represents so much more. In Isaiah, it says that Jesus was beaten so badly that he was unrecognizable as a man. He was flogged. He'll be carrying a cross. And it's interesting to me, I don't know about you, but, but in 24 hours, Jesus is going to be on the cross. But in Luke 22, it says that Jesus said, with longing, I have desire to commune with you. Can I tell you, church, tonight, Jesus desires to commune with you and I. Isn't that good news? Yeah. That you didn't have to come tonight perfect for Jesus to desire to commune with you. This is what it means to be in relationship with Jesus. And so when we, when we take and eat his body, some people say the verbs of our fall in the garden where, where Satan tempted Eve and then Adam 
he also said, take and eat. And so it's like Jesus using the same verbs of our fall to be the same verbs of our redemption. But he says, when you take and eat, you're going to find life. You're going to have my body. You're going to have purpose. You're going to be my part of my family. So this wafer, I know this is our 2024 style of communion, but I want to tell you this means so much more. Because it took his life for what we hold in our hands. So let's do as Jesus commands. Let's take and eat what represents his body. When we look at the cup, it says, Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. How many of you have missed it with God? Anybody? Any honest people in the house? Can I just tell you, every time I ask that question in church, everybody's always hesitating about, like, everybody here should go up. Quick. <laughs> the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And so it's not just his body was sacrificed, but his blood was shed that covers all of us. I was talking to the CCA parents yesterday, and they were, I was asked, what was the meaning of Easter to parents that take their kids to CCA? Can I just tell you, 9 o'clock in the morning, a lot of parents are not up, man. You know me, I'm excited and passionate. I was like, can I get an amen? I was like, crickets all over. And I said to them, I said, do you realize the blood covers all of your sin? Not a lot of excitement in the house. Nothing against the parents. If you're a parent, CCA parent, I understand. You need a coffee. I get it. <laughs> but I said, it's like somebody, it's like Jesus saying to you, if you have a mortgage today and you just got a letter from your bank and they said, your, the rest of your mortgage is paid in full. What did I do to qualify? You didn't do anything to qualify. You just need to trust me and believe that it's paid in full. Did I have to earn it? Did I have to work my way up to it? No. Simply because you have faith in me, your sins are forgiven. That is it. It is taken care of, right? So I said, on top of that, not just your current house, but if you were to go purchase a new house, the debt that covered your existing house, also covers your future home and any other future home that you go to. That's what it means to be paid in full. His, he wasn't just paying for what was happening in the moment. He was paying for everything that you were going to be going through and all the ways that you were going to mess up. And can I just say, I don't know any other God out there that offers that level of payment because I know I'm not always good. <laughs> I know I'm not always perfect, but when Jesus says to tell us die and it's paid in full, it's like taking a check out of his bank account and says, your debt is paid, your debt is paid, you believe in me, your debt is paid, your debt is paid, why? Your children's debt is paid. It's a, when they come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, everybody's debt is paid. I'm going to need my mic in a minute. There you go. I guess God wanted me to go back to my mic. I was just trying to, I was trying to change it up. <laughs> so just, so as you hold the cup, can you just close your eyes for a moment? And I want you to just think about all the ways that you felt you missed it with God. And maybe even right now, before you take that cup, you want to ask God for forgiveness even now. Maybe there's something in your life right now. You just say, God, here's my struggle. Would you, would you forgive me? Maybe there's something you want to talk to God about. 
before you take the cup. So ponder for a moment. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Let's just be in the presence of God. If there's something fresh in your mind, in your heart right now, you're saying, Lord, this thing over my mind, this thing over my heart, this thing over my family keeps getting in the way of our relationship. God, would you take it away before I take this cup? Let's take a moment. And if you feel ready, as Jesus commands, and he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of your sins, even right now. And Jesus says, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And we're going to do just that. We're going to walk it out like the disciples. So, Matt, if you can come up, we're going to sing a hymn right after communion. And the hymn that, that this verse refers to is Psalm 118, where it says, Give thanks to the Lord. Because his love endures forever. And so let's sing this hymn together and then we'll continue our service. Why don't we just all stand? Let's just worship God together on our feet. Let's reverence him together in this song.
You may have a seat. So the story continues. You see, we have the vantage point of looking back the cross. But if we're going to look at this from a fresh perspective and fresh eyes and a fresh experience, they sung a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. Jesus is predicting that Peter is going to deny him. He says, all of y'all are going to betray me. So the very ones that had just communed with Jesus are now going to basically see him get arrested. And scene two is the garden. The garden of Gethsemane, we, we see this in verse 36. It says this, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for you for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Who are we in this scene? We are the weak ones. And honestly, I'm thankful that God reminds me that I don't have enough strength to save myself. You don't have enough strength to save you. And, it, and it's interesting because Jesus is in the garden. He takes these disciples and he says his soul is overwhelmed to the point of sorrow. Has, has anyone ever felt overwhelmed in their life before where you felt like you don't know what your next step is, where you felt you don't have solutions, you don't have answers, you, you have problems and you have challenges of life today, especially today. And I'll share with our staff, there was one day I woke up and some of y'all know I like to run and do a couple of things. And, and can I just say, I was overwhelmed. And when I mean overwhelmed, that's, that's when this thing is not cooperating with this thing, and this storm is not cooperating with this storm, and this storm is not cooperating with this storm. But the storms all seem to be channeling to you. Have you ever felt that before? I thought I had some real people in church tonight. I'm just like, you don't got to be nice with me. And, and so the Lord had to remind me that I'm not smart enough and I'm not strong enough. And I have to realize when Paul says, when I am weak, he is strong. But we see Jesus in the height of his humanity. He is God in flesh, but, but in humanity, he's got to walk through this situation. 
he's saying, God, my soul is overwhelmed. In verse 39, he tells the disciples, go a little farther. But he says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. What is this cup? This cup is the cup of God's complete wrath and all the sin of mankind. Not just the sin that's in here, not just the way we miss it with God, but all the entire world, this God, this Jesus was taking it all on him. So when I'm thinking about myself being overwhelmed and you overwhelmed, can I just say, if Jesus is saying he's overwhelmed, just imagine that the weight of all humanity is resting on Jesus. And, and what if Jesus said no? <laughs> Where would we be? <laughs> but he said, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will is, your will. And, and I thought about that sometimes, sometimes, and, and maybe you could appreciate this. Jesus is talking to his father, but I was in a situation today, and I have to give you some context because there was a 16-year-old girl today who right now was in the presence of Jesus. And she had a situation, she was in, I, I can't, I don't even have words, just, just to tell you how raw it is, but I feel like God wants me to share this. She had a reaction to something, her heart stops, they don't get oxygen to her in time, and automatically she has no brain activity. She's on a ventilator for a week, and I'm watching these parents, and as they're going to take her off the ventilator, I'm, I'm thinking about God's wills. Everybody's praying. I don't know about you. Like, I still believe that God is a miracle worker. Anybody in the house, right? So God can still heal. God can still restore. I believe in the redemptive blood of Jesus. I have no doubt. So when I pray to God about healing, or about somebody being freed, I have no doubt God can do it. But when you put somebody before you and you're saying, God, at the end of the day, if it's your will, though, that's the part that's hard. <laughs> and so what God was telling me in that moment, sometimes my will is hard. And when you think about God's will for your lives today, I sometimes challenge you from the pulpit. I said, there's no greater will or, or, or way to fulfill your life than to follow God's will for your life. I know it's hard, but sometimes God's will doesn't align with your desires. And so you have to be like Jesus sometimes. So, so we're the weak ones, but sometimes in life, when you're asking God, help me make this decision. God, what should I do in this situation? You say, God, I think, I think we should go this way. I think you're, you're directing my life in this way. But you have to say to God, nevertheless, let your will be done. You may not understand it. It may not align with your wishes, but sometimes God's will is difficult. He says to close, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it. May your will be done. I was sharing with our CCA parents, Jesus didn't just come to be born. He came to die. We look back on Christmas, praise God, the birth of Jesus and all of this, but ultimately, Jesus was destined for the cross. So when we think about his will being done, the reason why Good Friday is good for us because the will of the Father was that God sent Jesus to die on a cross for us, let's go to scene three. Scene one was communion. Scene two, the garden. Scene three, Jesus is arrested. Judas betrays him. You all know the story. Scene three, for me in this movie, is the trial. So let's go to chapter 27, verse 15. It says this. 
Now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. I thought that was interesting. It's almost like I missed that in the Bible. Jesus Barabbas? Verse 17, so when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked him, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who's called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked, they all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Who are we in this scene? We all are Barabbas. Now, you might have heard that before. But Barabbas, his name means son of a father. And I thought that was interesting because in John chapter 1, Jesus says, to those who believe, he gave the right to be called what? Yeah, I have to have my Bible people in here. <laughs> to be children of God. So in essence, as there's this decision that Pilate is giving the people, Jesus is innocent. Barabbas is a well-known prisoner. And he gives them the option. And the one that he gives the, the crowd, he gives the option to Jesus Barabbas. It's the son of a father. And I think about believers in Jesus. We are all sons and daughters of a father. Who's our father? God, right? And we call him Abba, father. And so this word is almost like it's prophetic when you think about it. And so when they choose Barabbas, in essence, God is exchanging an innocent man, an innocent life for all of us. He sets him free. It says the word release. The word release means he was set free like we are set free in Christ. Can anybody celebrate the freedom that you have in Jesus? So what I want you to think and ponder on this thought for a moment. <laughs> what has Jesus set you free from? Can you celebrate that? What, what has Jesus set you free from and is still freeing you in some areas? I never get tired of celebrating somebody's freedom. When I think about the weight of what people are carrying today, you know, I, I, I've connected with other pastors and, and other guys that lead churches, and, and they have this statistic. I don't know if it's a Barna statistic. And sometimes we're preaching the gospel. Yes, it's still good news. But, but they, said, they said normally 60 to, 60 to 70, 60 to 70 percent of people that are coming in your church today are carrying something. I don't know what you're carrying today, but I know Jesus can set you free from it. I don't, I don't know what's, what you're burdened with now, but I know Jesus can set you free from it. Even stuff that you got your own self in a pickle, because Barabbas is not innocent. He's not. He's a prisoner. He deserves to be there. But he gets a release even when he doesn't deserve it. Can I just say, when you put your your trust in Jesus, right? This whole day represents this exchange. You have a bunch of people that don't deserve to be free, that don't deserve to be released from all kinds of things, but Jesus stands in the gap. And he takes your place.
I don't know if... <laughs> Some days I, I pray you just take inventory. And you stop the busyness of life. And you thank God that you are free. And if you don't even feel free today, can I, can I declare with a lot of confidence that even though you may not feel free in everything, you're on the path to freedom. God can set you free. God can release some of those things that you are struggling with right now. This is why Barabbas was set free. And I think about people today that they're not prisoners because they're behind bars. They're, they're prisoners because of where they are in life. So you have people that are walking free, but they feel like they're in prison. And that's just real talk. <laughs> so when Jesus steps in and he stands in the gap, and he goes on trial and he doesn't fight what's happening he willingly goes to the cross. Now, time doesn't allow me to go through all this, but we know they make Jesus carry his own cross. He's flogged. He's got a crown of thorns. You know all of the stories, and, and you think about what Jesus is walking through. I think sometimes, even today, when, when we think about life in our culture, we don't see people walking around with crosses today. We don't see this story necessarily playing out again and again. Yes, you have some places where I've seen they try to reenact this day. I get it. But what Jesus took in terms of beating and carrying the cross, no man I don't think can fathom. Like, I don't know about you, but if anybody ever watched The Passion of the Christ, right? Like, I can't watch that movie. I can't. It's just too gory. But imagine this happening in the story that we read. So Jesus now ends up on the cross. This is scene four. This is where we begin to close. Chapter 27, verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again, a loud voice, he gave up his spirit at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split. The last scene is the cross. Who are we in the scene? We are the nails. What gets me every time is that Jesus could have came down. But what kept him up there wasn't, wasn't the fact that these men had overpowered him or he wasn't God anymore. He couldn't send down a legion of angels. What kept him out, up on the cross was you and I. We were the nails. It was because of the love, the joy set before him. He endured the cross. I want you to think about that. If you were the only person that would accept Jesus, he would have died on the cross for you. If you were the one single person that believed by faith, he would have died and stayed on that cross for you. So I want you to get a fresh perspective of Jesus hanging on the cross. Saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me for you and I? We are the nails. And it says that he gave up his spirit willingly. There's a verse that says nobody takes his life. He, he lays it down willingly. And this is not in my notes, but 
even as I talk about it, I, it's like going back to all the things that I have done. All the things that you have done in life. And still Jesus chose you. I even think of some relationships where it's like, I'm done with you. You ever say that to somebody? Like, don't look at your spouse when you say that because you're still married and you're in covenant and you can't be doing nothing else. But go back home to your spouse and be like, make up, y'all. Okay, if you had an issue, come into church. You know what you need to do. <laughs> but he chose you and loved you unconditionally. And if you're not a believer in Jesus or you're on the fence with Jesus, sometimes it like boggles my mind because I go, how can you not believe in him? When he chose you on no merit whatsoever. Like you didn't have to work your way up to be chosen. He chose you anyway. I don't know nothing out there that offers you that same love. And it's not just a transaction. It's a relationship with Jesus. And so when you say, man, I chose to follow Jesus today. I give my heart to Jesus. Can I just say, he already chose you before you chose him. So then I say, who couldn't choose Jesus after he already chose? Like, Jesus, like, you see something in me? No, it's not about what he saw in you. He loved you despite what he sees in you. And what the, the enemy of your soul would tell you, you're not good enough. Jesus is upset with you. He won't choose you, and he won't continue to tarry with you. Can I just say, Jesus will choose you every time. Every time that you come to him, Jesus will choose you. He will chase you down. Why? Because he does it willingly. So as we look at Good Friday, these different scenes, I wanted to give you a fresh perspective. I wanted to take you through communion, give you... This idea that they sang a hymn, I wanted to take you through the garden because the disciples are like, I, I can't hang with you, Jesus. I I'm like too weak. I wanted to take you through this idea that, that you were set free. And I wanted to take you through this idea that Jesus chose you willingly. willingly. And the best way for us to end this, I won't open up the altar because usually Good Friday, we just kind of let it sit. But as we close down service, I want you to bow your heads with me. And we talked about this last week. Because Jesus paid it all and gave you all. Willingly. Would this Good Friday... Would you be willing to give your all back to Jesus? Is this something you need to surrender today? And say to God, because you gave it all to me, I want to give it all back, my life, to you. It's the best decision you can ever make. And maybe that speaks to somebody that doesn't know Jesus. Maybe that speaks to you. You've been walking with Jesus for a long time, but you've been holding back some of your heart. And you say, God, would you occupy completely the throne of my heart? It, would, it boggles my mind that sometimes the children of Israel could look back on all the miracles of God. They could look back at Jesus, part, uh, God parting the Red Sea, and they still would drift. Maybe today some of us have drifted from God. And you say, God... Call me back. I'm willing to come back. I don't know where you are today, but if you want prayer for, for our willingness to give your all to Jesus, I just want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you today. If you just say, God, that's me. That's my heart. I want to give all back to you. Just an honest moment with God. Because you paid it all and you were willing, I want to give it all back. So, Lord, we 
pray and thank you for your willingness to die. It says that you didn't get your spirit taken from you. You gave up your spirit and you gave it up willingly. And so because you chose us, God, we want to choose you. So, God, I pray for the hands and the hearts that are here represented today. God, we, we willingly give ourselves back to you. Full surrender. No holding back, God. This is our honest prayer tonight. We thank you for what you did, but we also want to give you our lives. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Can we celebrate God today, tonight? Why don't you stand to your feet? We don't normally close this way, but I just feel led. If there's something you need prayer for, if you're a prayer encourager, could you just come up? If there's something you need prayer for and you're just like, man, before I leave, I just want to pray. We just don't want you to leave without being prayed over. So if you want prayer, you can come forward. If you don't need prayer, Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday. This concludes our service. Like I said, three services on Sunday, 7.30, 9.30, 11.30. God bless you, and thank you for coming out.